Today we're talking about a Spider-Man variant who spun out of the Spider-Verse to quickly become a fan favorite. Today we're talking all about Spider-Punk. First, thanks for watching JL's Comics. Hit that subscribe button so you can keep up with all of our weekly content, and with that out of the way, let's jump right into our story. In the Spider-Verse story, a villain named Morlin led his family called the Inheritors on a campaign through reality in different dimensions to hunt down various versions of Spider-Man. What they were specifically hunting were spider totems, where these energy vampires wanted to consume them to take their essence and their powers as their own. In the Marvel Universe, the fabric of reality was threaded together by a deity named Anansi, the Great Weaver, spinning together the web of life and destiny. Ages ago, Kwaku Anansi was a mortal from Ghana on the African continent. Anansi struck a deal with a creator god named Nyambi, a powerful deity who was part of the Vodou pantheon and who hailed from an earth-adjacent pocket dimension called Oran the Great Beyond, which had nexus gates located in Africa, where temples and their name were eventually constructed. Anansi offered his services for power, and so Nyambi granted him this power and commissioned him to begin threading together the Great Web. It connected everything across time and across dimensions, and lower on that spider pantheon were lesser deities called spider totems who had specific roles in the web, keeping it together, re-threading as needed, and repairing and monitoring the web of life and destiny. These were beings like the Bride, the Pattern Maker, the Other, the Gatekeeper, and Master Weaver. In turn, each spider totem could select an avatar to represent them on each Earth, which is where the Spider-Verse Spider-Man variants come in. For example, Peter Parker is the Other's avatar, Spider-Man Noir is Spider-God's avatar, Cindy Moon aka Silk is the avatar of the Bride, and in Earth-616 Peter Parker's case, the Great Weaver also called the Other personally selected him as its avatar, and though he subconsciously rejected this influence when he first became Spider-Man, it relates to why so many of his foes took on the moniker and symbolism of animals and the animal kingdom. In Amazing Spider-Man issue 14, we learn that if one of the spider totems is killed, or if its blood splashes on the web of life, that its tie is cut with the web, and the web begins to unravel, potentially, eventually unraveling all of reality with it. The main nexus point for the Great Web is Earth-001, aka Loom World, residence and prison of the Master Weaver, and home to a villain named Morlin and his family called the Inheritors. In Sensational Spider-Man issue 26, Madame Web revealed that this grand unseen tapestry was the source of her precognitive powers, and it explains the root of what the spider sense, or Peter Tingle are. Hobart Hobie Brown was a variant of both Spider-Man and Earth-616's Prowler, debuting as the Earth-138 Spider-Man variant Spider-Punk, the anarchic Spider-Man, during 2015's Spider-Verse event. But his development history was slightly more complicated than that. Dan Slott's parents were actually expatriates, and so young Dan spent a lot of time growing up in London, England. And like many, he wondered what a Spider-Man from his town would look like, so he'd always had in the back of his mind a British Spider-Man. The fast-forward decades and the framework for the Spider-Verse was being planned out. The artist on the book had come up with a character design for a character, and when he brought the design to Slot, Dan said that this was not Spider-UK, for there were no Union Jack flags on the character's costume, but this character was very punk. Punk as a subculture has its roots in London, England in the 1970s with bands like The Clash, The Buzzcocks, Sex Pistols, and later with the post-punk movement in bands like The Smiths and Joy Division. At one point, the Ramones covered the theme song to Spider-Man's animated series, though it was their Blitzkrieg bop that was used in the Spider-Man Homecoming movie and I Wanna Be Your Boyfriend was on the Far From Home soundtrack. So anyway, that's the angle that artist Capel was going for with his character design. As a result of that, though, this design became Spider-Punk, and a new design was used for Billy Braddock, aka Spider-UK. Another connection to Punk was made when they made Spider-Punk the Spider-Man of Earth-138, a reference to the Misfits song We Are-138, a song which itself was inspired by George Lucas's pre-Star Wars THX 1138 film, at least according to Misfits bassist Jerry Only. On the dystopian cyberpunky Earth-138, Norman Osborn was the President of the United States. It was President Osborne's venom-powered Thunderbolts who served as his enforcers, a heavy-handed draconian police force that beat the underclass out of the streets, clashing in violent confrontations. The totalitarian regime of Osborne, his administration, and their enforcers could basically do whatever they wanted, and they, among many other unethical activities, were freely dumping toxic waste. This dumping poisoned and irradiated the land and environment around the dump sites, including animal life like spiders. Amidst that turmoil was a young homeless kid in New York City named Hobart Hobie Brown. Homeless Hobie was squatting in an abandoned building merely to have a roof over his head, presumably near a toxic dump site, which might explain why the building was empty. Well, one of those radioactive spiders bit Hobie, turning him into the anarchic Spider-Man. But in this world, with great power comes no future. Despite that, Hobie wanted to use his newfound power to fight back, to rise up for the beaten and the downtrodden, the stepped on and the forgotten. 
He chose the logo FNSM, meaning Friendly Neighborhood Spider-Man, and used the NYHC, New York Hardcore logo, as inspiration in its design, and affixed it to a studded, spiked cut. Then, the best way to fight back against the Venom symbiotic-empowered Thunderbolt police force was with sound, and so Hobie used his electric guitar hooked up to amps and massive speakers to fight back. Hobie became a radioactive suicide machine, leading a spider army of stepped-on, beat-down, hard-luck losers. Spider-Man, his friend Captain Anarchy, who on Earth-616 is Carl Morgenthau the Flag Smasher, along with their spider army, became the last stand against Osborne and his police force. They didn't have the media or the government on their side, but they had love and rage and clenched fists and music. Spider-Punk raised his guitar pick high in the sky as the Venom police force moved in on them and then thrashed hard, punk music filling the air, sound waves beating back the oppression. It was 15,000 watts of punk rock from a mountain of speakers that turned the streets into a massive mosh of pogo, headbanging, and agonized symbiotes. In the chaos, Osborne's own symbiote morphed and pulsated, the amorphous blob barely remaining on him as the sound waves coursed through his body. Osborne took out a revolver and aimed it at Spider-Punk, wanting to kill him, but Spider-Punk raised his electric guitar high in the air and then swung it down and the body of the guitar smashed Osborne in the neck, severing his head from his body and nearly smashing the guitar to pieces, Pete Townsend style. With Osborne dead and the cops defeated, Spider-Punk removed his mask and raised his splattered guitar high above his head, a salute to the resistance, defiance, and solidarity of unity with his spider army. That was the day that they took America back, and that was the day that Spider-Punk became a hero. That was also the day that put him on the radar of Dr. Otto Octavius, who was at this time Superior Spider-Man. And Superior Spider-Man wanted to recruit Spider-Punk to join his Superior Spider Army. Otto said Hobie was angry, unpredictable, rabble-rousing, and perfect. The reason Otto was assembling an army was that he had become displaced in time and had wound up in the year 2099. There, he built the time machine to get back to his own time and his own world, and on that journey back, he began jumping to different Earths across the multiverse, fighting dead spider people as he went, and he came to realize that somebody was hunting spiders. So Spider-Punk joined the Superior Spider-Man and Assassin Spider-Man of the Superior Spider Army to fight back against the Inheritors. The trio went to the Ultimate Universe, Earth-1610, to help Black Widow and Miles Morales defeat an inheritor named Verna, and then recruit them to their army using a Terminator 2 come with me if you want to live approach. Miles was incredulous, so Spider-Punk said, Spider up or die. Meanwhile, another army of spider people were gathering on Earth-13, their designated safe zone, which is where Peter Parker of Earth-616 learned he was special, as he was the only one up to that point who had managed to defeat an inheritor, which happened to be Moreland himself, and which helped kick off the inheritor's retaliatory campaign. A group of Spider-Men from the gathering went to the Superior Spider Army to try to recruit them, but the abrasive, combative nature of Otto seemingly derailed that before it began. However, when the inheritors attacked their position, the two Spider-Man factions fought back together. After some of them fell in battle, including a version of Spider-Man and Old Man Spider that happened to be Ezekiel Sims, Spider-Punk and Otto's faction went back to the safe zone with them. And while others deployed on multiversal missions, Spider-Punk was with Ashley Barton, Mayday, Benji, Penny, Captain Universe, and others when the Inheritors Morlin, Genix, and Solus attacked their safe haven. They killed Captain Spider and Spider-Monkey right in front of Spider-Ham, Betty Brant, Spider-Woman, Spider-Man, and Spider-Punk, who was now wearing a new cut and rocking a Devil Horns hand sign patch. When Captain Universe battled Solus, Spider-Punk looked on while Spider-UK called for reinforcements. But then Solus sucked the Enigma Force out of Captain Universe and killed him right in front of Punk and the others. And right in front of the shocked Spider-Punk and the Spider-Army, Morlin then stole Benji, the baby Spider-Man, who was the avatar of Scion, the last totem to manifest in any reality. Spider-Punk said, We are so screwed. Then the spiders out on sorties called in and lightning crashed in the sky. Spider-Punk clenched his fist as Leopardon portaled in from Japan to join the fray. As Leopardon fought with the Inheritors, Spider-Man of India said, We have to do something, and Spider-Punk said, I am doing something, I'm crapping in my pants. Leopardon bought them enough time to escape, and Spider-Punk, Spider-Gwen, and others portaled to the dinosaur-inhabited Earth-8847. But Verna and her hounds caught up with them and attacked, with Spider-Punk literally going head-to-head -head with Hammerhead. Silk then led Spider-Punk and the army to the irradiated wasteland of Earth-3145 in a hidden fallout shelter there, built by Ezekiel Sims long ago and where an Uncle Ben was hiding out. And while there, Jessica Drew on Loomworld sent them some scrolls foretelling of a prophecy and some rituals that needed blood, including Benji's, for them to be completed. So Spider-Man put together a team consisting of Spider-Punk, Spider-UK, Anya Corazon, Aranya, aka Spider-Girl, Ashley Barton as another Spider-Girl, aka Spider-Bitch, all with Spider-Man India, and they headed to Earth-3123. And there the Inheritor Karn was trying to eat and devour, and Aunt May, who on her world, was Spider-Ma'am. 
So this team portal right there with Spider Punk taking a massive swing at Karn with his Fender guitar, and the guitar struck Karn right in his helmeted face. In response, Karn swatted Spider Punk away with a backhand strike. Despite that, they weren't there to fight. Spider-Man UK asked Karn to join them, citing the split between Karn and the rest of his family. Karn said there was no hope and tossed Ashley into Anya, so Spider-Punk headbutted Karn with his spiked head and said, That's what the power structure wants you to think, that there's no hope. That's when you gotta stand up and fight. You wanna die on your feet or live on your knees, which is very Bob Marley and very punk rock. And then he told Karn, Do what you gotta do, which reminds me of a Nina Simone song written by the appropriately named Jimmy Webb. Together the strike team went to Loom World to link up with the Spider Army and the Web Warriors for the final battle against the Inheritors. They all jumped into the fray with Spider Punk yelling, Fight the power! A very public enemy thing to say. They were all able to defeat the Inheritors and trout Morwen in the Fallout Shelter on Earth 3145. In the epilogue, the Spider Army parted ways to go back to their Earths. Spider UK said goodbye to Spider Punk, though Punk remained a bit salty and reminded him that Karn had killed a lot of spiders and to make sure he didn't turn on them. Spider-Punk returned in Web Warriors issue 7, rocking out on the cover with other spiders as the punk rockers of the Spider-Verse, singing about anarchy in the spider-web. There were papers featuring Vulture and Surfing Board, which is a Trashman song covered by the Ramones and by Peter Griffin. There was another article about Doc Ock with the header, I fought the web and the web won, paraphrasing a song covered by groups like Green Day, The Clash, Dead Kennedys, and Social Distortion. Now Spider-Punk was the lead singer of a band called The Spider Slayers. It was Adrian Toomes, Vulture, of Tombstone Records who cut Spider-Punk's concert off, saying he owned the free media net that the Spider Slayers were broadcasting over. Toomes sent his Vulture Records army in riot gear to attack Spider-Punk and his Spider Army. Spider-Punk was about to thwip Vulture in the face when Spider-Ham dressed as Spider-Man 2099 showed up, and so Punk webbed up the ham and brought him back to Earth-001 where people like Lady Spider, Spider-Man India, and the female Doc Ock were still working as Karn became the new Master Weaver. Anya Corazon showed up after him, followed by Spider-Gwen, who Spider-Punk freaked out about. He said on his Earth, Gwen Stacy was a legendary musician who died far too soon. Spider-Punk brought the Web Warriors to his Earth to show them how this ham that showed up was the point of an impending invasion force, an army of Doom-like duckbots that were descending on the city, led by Dr. Doom 2099. Apparently, some of the strands of the Great Web were entangled and worlds were blending together. It happened to be these duckbots who were the ones who took out the vulture shock troopers, but when they disappeared, megamorphs like the massive arachnofighter showed up in Spider-Punk's city. Then a rogue dissonant strand of the Great Web washed over them and sent the web warriors to different Earths. Spider-Punk was still trapped on Earth-138, along with Lady Spider, Spider-Girl, and the arachnofighter. They had the idea to use the megamorph Spidey to make a new communicator to not be stranded anymore. While Lady Spider and Spider-Girl worked on a solution, Spider-Punk beat Robot Spider-Man's metal foot with drumsticks. A rhythmic beat that resonated through his metal and wired up body, making music to express his rage about a world bought and sold by corporations and people's apathy about the whole thing. Lady Spider hooked Spider-Punk's guitar set to that mecha Spidey to charge up the portal bracelets and now charged up, they were able to portal to help the rest of the web warriors defeat an army of zombified Electros. Back on Loom World, to save the web of life now from a Norman Osborn, Spider-Punk hooked his electric guitar and amp to Arachnofighter and charged him up with that Electro army across the multiverse and then paired up with Spider-Gwen who was on drums to rock the entire multiverse to save reality by shaking the web with music. Afterward, Punk wanted to cut an album with Gwen, but she said his look is cool but his singing voice is awful. In other words, no. Then in 2016's Deadpool Too Soon Infinite comic, Spider-Punk was playing pitcher in a game of baseball in Central Park, along with other spiders in various versions of Wolverine, with Sleepwalker as the umpire. Deadpool walked up and ruined their game, so they all chased after him and chased Deadpool away. 2018's Edge of Spider-Geddon took us back to the streets of Earth-138, New York City. There we see Spider-Punk was beating up Eric Masterson, Thunderstrike, with a baseball bat, when a guy named King the Conglomerator vaporized Masterson. King said that in the year 2099, King Cole Limited owned all rights to merch, likeness, and IP associated with Spider-Punk. Spider-Punk corrected King, saying he was Spider-Man, not Spider-Punk, and fought with King's Spider-Punk plushie army until his friend Captain Anarchy showed up to help. Hobie then went to his friend Robbie Banner, a hooked out atom bomb for help. Though not shown, Punk said Robbie had helped him trash the UFOs at the Hellfire Club, aided him in this world's Doctor Strange in defeating the Church of Universal Truth in Queens, New York, and even fought Hydra, and he needed his help again. Robbie transformed into Hulk, and when he was done beating up Kang, Kang revealed that Hobie was destined to die young. And like any good star, that was highly bankable for him. Then Spider-Woman showed up, asking for help again, and so Spider-Punk left with her, singing Ace of Spades by Motorhead on the way through the portal. 
In issue 4, we learn that Norman Osborn was working on research on a fragmented and damaged cosmic cube and ended up fighting Harry Osborn who'd broken into Oscor. And in their inevitable fight, the cube was hit with a blast and they were knocked out. And when Norman awoke, he was in the web of life. Spider-Punk showed up and ensnared him with his webbing, thinking he was actually Norman, and pulled him through the portal. And on Loomworld, Spider-Punk was helping, sort of, monitor the inheritors, namely Moreland, by sending Spider-Bot drones to the Fallout Shelter. Unbeknownst to them, Moreland was gathering up the drones and reverse-engineered them, using them to communicate with his family across the multiverse. So the Web Warriors gathered once more, and they first went to pick up Miles Morales. They then went to confront Superior Octopus, who was using Inheritor's technology to make clones of himself and to tell him of the risk and the potential blowback for doing this, which was foretold in Karn's web prophecies. That's when the Inheritors showed up, drawn there by Dr. Octopus using their technology, and they ate Spider-Man Noir and Spider-UK and then declared this Earth their replacement homeworld since Loomworld was gone. They ended up webbing up the Inheritors' cloning tubes and set the lab to self-destruct and they escaped while Spider-Gwen held them off, seemingly perishing in the blast. And back on Loomworld, Superior Ox said they had to kill the Inheritors this time instead of imprisoning them and keeping them alive. And Spider-Punk, who keeps insisting to call him Spider-Man, agreed. The Spider-Army faction went to attack the Inheritors while the Superior Spider-Army faction remained on Webworld, though Spider-Punk wanted to go help the younger Spider-People. At first, Otto as Superior Spider-Man said no, but Leopardon smashed a hole in the building, a hole which Spider-Punk and some of the Spider-Men swung through to help. After the fight, they were back aboard Leopardon, where Spider-Punk and the group debated new recruits like Spider-Cop and a devil dinosaur spider, and back on Loomworld, Norman Osborn and Spider's Man left the group and headed through the portal after destroying Loomworld, trying to trap the Inheritors on Earth-616, which is where the rest of the Spider-Army was. So Spider-Punk and the team then battled with the Inheritors once again led by an Enigma Force empowered Miles Morales and backed up by the Spider-Girls and the Web Warriors. Spider-Punk saw Spider-Gwen and ran up and hugged her, relieved she wasn't dead, which is when she took on the nickname Ghost Spider. Then every single spider piled on Morlon and he was finally defeated. They transferred the Inheritor's consciousness into baby clones and gave them a new chance to be better. With the web down, until someone weaved a new one, Punk and Gwen parted ways, saying they would chill on the dimensional travel for a bit unless there was an emergency or the band had a gig. In the Spider-Geddon aftermath, Spider-Punk went to Loomworld to give Karn, their weird alien vampire friend, a funeral, and they all raised their fists above their heads in solidarity. They all webbed up Karn, and then Spider-Punk took out his lighter and lit the silk on fire, burning Karn in a funeral pyre. As they left again, Punk asked Gwen if she was okay, and she said yes, but he reminded her, when she's picking her battles, that she doesn't have to fight them alone. In 2019's Spider-Verse, Spider-Zero was pulling Miles Morales through a recreated web, and as he passed through worlds, he wound up next to Spider-Punk, who happened to be fighting the Church of Universal Truth, but this time in the Bronx. In April of 2022, Spider-Punk got his own solo title, a five-issue miniseries, where he was still on his Earth, and now fighting Kraven the Hunter and some Nazi punks with Captain Anarchy. He beat them with his axe, and then went back to the Brooklyn Community Center, their headquarters, which they had dubbed the Spider-Base. He linked up with the rest of his new team, which he was calling the Spider Band, including Robbie, the Hulk, and Riri Williams as Riot Heart, and later Daredevil Drummer of Philly. Spider Punk had to battle Taskmaster, Norman Osborn, and Kingpin, with the Spider Band traveling around in the Spider Van too. And so Spider Punk keeps on fighting the good fight, carrying on into the future with exciting stories that won't leave you sedated, even if you want to be. And with that, that's a wrap on this one, my friends. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe, and you'll be one of the first to know when I upload videos just like this every week. I'm Jesse, this is JLS Comics, and I'll see you soon.